This is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk to the guitar legend from Great White, Mark Kendall. We talk about what the band is up to today, and we hear some classic stories from the past. Check it out! 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 Mark, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing, man? Thank you, sir. Doing good. So, you're out on tour. How's the tour going? It's going good. I mean, we're not out on a bus or anything. We uh, mostly do fly dates, you know, And uh, but the shows are going well. We've sold, I think, three shows out this year, so we're doing, we're doing pretty good, man. The fans are awesome. Yeah, I watched some clips uh, that you guys released with Mitch Malloy, man. Sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's a great front man, always brings it every night, you know, um, the fans love him and uh, we're thrilled to have him. So what kind of stuff can the fans expect uh, when they go out and see you? What kind of songs are you guys playing? Um, we pretty much just pick, you know, kind of the best stuff. We have some jams, you know, that we don't really know how long they're going to go or, you know, <laughs> so... Uh, we try to bring the crowd right into the show, give them everything they would expect, and maybe a couple new ones, uh, or newer ones, and, uh, you know, we just try to keep it exciting for ourselves, but also give give the fans everything they like to hear. So, you know, we got a lot of records, so uh, we can't get it all in in one night, so we do, do the best you can, you know. How's that going with Slaughter? Are they behaving themselves out there? Slaughter, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, Mark sounded pretty good, and, uh, you know, the band sounds great, and uh, we get along really good with those guys. So I read that you guys are writing some material for a new album. Um, what's the direction you're headed in? Uh, no certain direction. We just, uh, whatever the best songs are, usually make the record. That's the way we've always done it. We, we you know, we never sit down and say, what type of record do you want to make? Or, you know what I mean? We just, we just write and what, you know, whatever comes natural and, and, and pick the best 12 songs or whatever, you know? So there's, there's not a lot of science to it. It's just, uh, you know, you write about 20 or 25 songs and, and you pick the best ones. You kind of, you know, I, I guess once you get, that many songs you want it to be you know diverse or whatever you don't want you know a bunch of songs that are similar in tempo or whatever so then you there might be a little bit of a preconceived notion but we don't sit and write a certain record you know we've never done that before any plans to work with like a certain producer on this one well we worked with wagner last time so that's a possibility um you know, he's, he's totally awesome cast master, uh, really knows the band well, and and he makes you feel super comfortable, so that that's definitely a possibility, but we're not really to that point yet, but, you know, we should be in not too long. So let's go back a little bit to the 80s, uh, because, hey, this is the 80s glam metal cast, right? So let's talk a little bit about when, yeah, you, guys, right <laughs> when you guys got started, uh, maybe around your first album. I mean, it had to be a crazy time with all these bands coming up, Motley Crue, Dokken. Just talk about that a little bit. Right. Well, um, okay, uh, when we, well, we were playing the whiskey uh, one night, just a weeknight, you know, no big deal. Um, and Alan Niven, the A&R man at the time from Enigma was in the crowd. I didn't know this until way later, but he'd already seen us two other times and was less than thrilled. But for some reason he came a third time. And that night we did No Doctor on the Encore. And when he heard that, he goes, okay, I can see, I can make something happen with this just the way we delivered that song and gave us his card. We went down. He, uh, he liked everything except for our name. And our name at the time was Dante Fox was, was less than thrilling, but I guess he was standing out in front of the whiskey waiting for his car. And I, I drove by in a car and I stuck my head out the window and screamed something into the crowd. 
And some kid next to him goes, there goes Great White. And when he heard that, I guess something clicked in his head, and he goes, that's their name. So when we went the next day for a meeting with them, he uh, he said he liked everything except for the the name. So he changed it right there on the spot. We, we didn't really like it at first until we came up with the shark idea. Then we liked it. Um, but at that time, there wasn't a lot of bands. Um, you know, it was just a handful. Uh, Dokken, I believe, just had his first album out. Motley Crue was signed by Enigma one year before we met this uh, A&R man, Alan Nibben. And so there was a few, and Rat still hadn't, didn't have anything out yet. So after we did our EP, I think Rat came with an EP after that. But um, when we we had Michael Wagner fly out from Germany and we did a five song EP and we got airplay on On Your Knees, which was one of the tracks on the five song EP on, on KMET, which is kind of unheard of because we didn't really have a proper record deal. We only had a distribution deal. So when they started playing that song in heavy rotation, the major label started, you know, calling us. And so we went to nine different labels. We got on EMI America, which only had Queensryche at the time. And, you know, other, as far as our ilk. And uh, we thought we'd get more attention if they didn't have a huge roster. So we went with that label. We, we went over to to the UK and toured with White Snake for two months, just you know Scotland, Ireland, that that type of a tour, England, and then we went on tour. Oh, this at first, let me yeah. After we made a full length album, BMI America, and we went on tour with White Snake in 1983. <laughs> okay, so then. We got a tour with Judas Priest in the States in 1984. Toured with them for seven months, I believe. And we didn't sell a lot of records. We sold about 100,000, maybe a little more than 100,000. And the record company was less than thrilled. But back in those days, they used to have what was called artist development. If you, if you just sold say a hundred thousand or whatever, usually they work with you, maybe bring in a songwriter, try, you know, to do something to get you up to two fifty or whatever. But in this case, the uh the president at the time, Gary Gersh, he, he just didn't want to deal with it. So he goes, We owe you another record, but we're really not gonna push it or anything. So we figured why waste music? So we were kind of dropped and we kind of left, however you want to put it, you know. So we went through 1985 with no deal. And then the father company to EMI America, which was Capitol Records, an A&R guy came down and saw us at a club in San Juan Capistrano, California, at a place called, um, God, what is the name of that place? I can't remember, but anyway. Uh, the coach house. Anyways, he, he, a guy called Ray Tuscan came down and he signed the band that night to Capitol. So <laughs> here we go. So at that time, we had just put out a record on our own called Shot in the Dark just by, with borrowed money and, you know, getting deals on studio time and kind of forcing it. And then, uh, so Capitol Records put their their name on that, but didn't really push it. We only did four shows after we got signed with them, and they said, go in the studio and make a, a record. So that's when we came with Rock Me, you know, Lady Red Light and all those songs. So it was pretty much our second opportunity. It was a do or die situation. We were very lucky and got a big hit with Rock Me. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I mean, you know, we've been going plugging along ever since. So that must have been like a relief and, and, and pretty exciting because here it is, like you guys had kind of struggled with the first few albums, and then, man, when you guys hit, yeah. you hit big. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, mainly because, well, this was the first time that we'd ever made a, a, a record from scratch with the major label without having to give them a demo or, you know, yep. uh, you know what I mean? It was like, go make a record. So we made a record from scratch with a major label. That was the first time was when we came with Rock Me and all that. So, so that, that was kind of a thrill. That's a, So that was a million seller, and then... Hey man, lightning strikes twice, yeah. right? Then you're it's two million for twice shy, right? Yeah, about about two and a half million for twice shy. Um, I think one point eight million or something like that. It's over two now, both of them, and uh, twice shy is over three. So all together with all the greatest hits that you know, we had a greatest hits go gold a couple years ago. Um, every time we put out new music, they come with something some kind of package, you know what I mean? So all together we've sold close to 11 million probably, which it isn't setting the world on fire, you know, as far as our peers and stuff, but it's pretty good. You know, we came from a garage and we played in people's backyards, you know, <laughs> so we pretty much started out pretty crappy and we got a little better from, you know, just jamming together and going out and grinding it out and playing everywhere we could. And, you know, we we definitely had a dream, and we tried to play it more than what we thought everybody else was playing, and which meant a lot of times we played three, and uh, just to try to get our name out there. And I remember talking to the singer. I go, "Let's treat treat this like a Tide commercial. It's like when you go to the store, you always buy go to get laundry detergent. You always go to the Tide because you always see that commercial. You know, and so we're thinking." If people see our band everywhere, everywhere they go, you know, we'll kind of brainwash them into liking us. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and plus, you know, kind of put ourselves in a position to get lucky instead of just playing a couple times a month, you know. Let's play six days a week, if we can, you know. So it was a lot of work. We did that for about eight years, you know. And finally, uh, the right guy was in the crowd and, and things came together. So if we fast forward a little bit and we, we get to when you guys were doing the Hooked album, was the expectation that, okay, you guys did a million, you did two million, was the expectation that you could do three? Or, or what, 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 what did the label think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they wanted to get four million. You know, um, <laughs> right. I don't really think, at least this is just my opinion, and a lot of the fans like that record, but I, I don't think we we quite had what we needed on that record. I don't think, uh, I think we kind of rushed through that. I think maybe we should have done something different with the production. There's a lot of, you know, afterthoughts on my end. Uh, I don't know what the other guys think, but I don't think, I think we should have really stepped up our game right there was a great opportunity. And I think we kind of fell a little short, at least in my opinion. Well, if I don't know if you knew nope. what was going on last night, if that that was me, but I posted uh, the big goodbye last night, and uh, people were going crazy over on Twitter. Yeah, I saw that. Um, you know, we play that in the set, and people uh, still like that tune. You know, so yeah, that's that's pretty pretty rocking. Somebody mentioned I saw I saw in your tweet. Uh, somebody mentioned you know. This video is kind of weird. There's no bass player. And, and it was kind of a semi-joke on our end because at that time we didn't have a bass player. Um, Tony Tony Montana, when he joined the band, he was actually a guitar player, but he just played bass just for a gig type thing. Like he could play bass, I guess, good enough to get away with it. But I, I don't think he thought the band was going to last, you know, an eternity. So after four years, he wanted to play guitar again. So he kind of, he he could have probably stayed in the band, but we could tell his heart wasn't in it. So we told him, go play guitar, dude. Right. I go, I'll come to your show, you know. <laughs> um, so we got Dave Spitz. He, he was, they called him the Beast. Um, I don't know a lot about his career. I know his brother is in Anthrax. He plays guitar, but uh, Dave's a great bass player, so he played on Psycho City. But after the album, he just went home, 
And then we had to hunt for a bass player. So when we did that video, we didn't have a bass player. So <laughs> we did the video without one. And, and that's the first time I've ever heard anybody notice that. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That was actually Greg from uh, Van Halen Rising there. He, he noticed that. And uh, I did too because I noticed a lot of other videos. Let's see if the guy wasn't really in the band anymore. They put some like... You know, scab guy, <laughs> just maybe show him for a split second. You know, you never really yeah. saw his face. So, so that was funny that you guys did that. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't even do that because Tony was like full on a wall. That was it. We, we were, he was out of the band. I mean, we literally made a record uh, with another bass player, but um, he wasn't really like what we were looking for as far as uh, being in the band. But he, he was a kind of a taskmaster uh, bass player, you know. Good session man, really, really had good sound and, and played real well. But uh, so we auditioned probably 20 bass players, you know, but we didn't have one when we did the video, so we just did it without one. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Now, I mean, I mean, you're just faking, you're faking it anyways. I mean, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, whatever. So you kind of mentioned, like, looking back on Hook, you weren't really – you know, you think you could have did something maybe a little bit different with the production. Do you think, in theory, then, Psycho City would have been better as the follow-up there? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we stepped up our game on, on Psycho City and uh, really, really got into it um, and, and made a good record. But the timing of that record uh, was kind of the downfall. Right. Because it was with the Seattle boom and everything and the Nirvana and, the, you know, that whole deal which I thought was great myself, but, um, you know, and kind of refreshing really, but, uh, you know, it didn't help us much. And, you know, so had we put out Psycho City, I believe that might have, uh, I, I think it would have done better. You know, now it's, it barely creeped to gold, and, you know, today even. So, yeah, that was a disappointment. I've been revisiting that album, and what I kind of like about it is that it feels like you kind of guys are going back to like your roots of like the metal roots. I hear a little bit more heavier riffs, like Jack's voice has a little bit more yeah. attack in it. And you know, he he's a great bluesy yeah. singer, but I feel like on that one, I'm hearing that metal vibe a little more. You know what I mean? I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where he shines. Um, you know, is uh, because. He, he didn't have a lot of riffs like Paul Rogers or something, so, but he has a lot of range and power, so when you do anything that, that's heavier, he, he really shines because he can hit all the notes with a lot of, with a lot of power. Now, with you guys, do you, do you, have, do you speak at all with him, or what, what's the story with your relationship? Um, you know, I haven't spoken to him in a long time. Uh, you know, I guess he's out there trying to do it. I, I know, you know, has to cancel shows and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, it, the situation was never, um, like, I hate you, or, you know, or some big fight or anything like that. It was just, it all had to do with substance abuse and, you know, him not taking care of himself and unable to perform, you know. So we just told him to go get well. And then after a year, he came at us with a lawsuit, and he wanted the name and just to hire people to play with him. So we were forced to defend ourselves. And um, but there's definitely no ill will. And besides that, I I never take anybody's addiction personal. Right. Because uh, I work with a lot of people with addiction problems daily. And that's one thing I never take it personal because I know it's a difficult thing to get away from, you know. So it's a tough situation. Yeah, I think with you guys and why you probably it gets brought up a lot is because when you look at if I look back, I look at Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Richie Sambora, Bon Jovi. You know what I mean? You guys were kind of like that duo, so that's probably why it comes up. You know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I totally agree with that. You know, it's really unfortunate. You know, uh, we went as long as we could until literally, you know, he had walkers and, you know, colostomy bags. And, it, you know, it was, just a, it was just a horrible situation, you know. And uh, we're all healthy and sober. And it, it's very difficult 
when you're in that situation. And we still have the energy to play music, so it started out just getting somebody to fill in. We even had Janie Lane in the band for like 10 shows. Oh, yeah, I read that, and, yeah. And then he, he just couldn't return, you know. And now he's out there, he's kind of struggling, but I, I guess, you know, he's able to play, and God bless him. Yeah. And, you know, look at so many bands. I mean, people, people you know, want to cry that the original guy isn't anymore, but it, but you look at uh, Queensryche, um, Foreigner, uh, you know, the list goes on. There, I mean, it, there's a lot of people that have moved on with yeah. different vocalists, so. Yeah, and it... it and it tells you how important the songs are. I mean, I was talking to this one guy, I go, you know, okay, who wrote Spirit in the Sky? You know, it's the greatest song ever, but nobody knows who wrote it. I mean, a few do, but you could ask 20 people on the street, and I'll bet 19 out of, 19 of them wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> uh, you know, people go see Foreigner, and not even Nick Jones is there half the time, and no one seems to care because they love the song so much and they're delivered so well. You know, um, I know Jeff Pilson does an excellent job at, at formulating uh, the vocals and making sure everything's perfect. And Kelly Hansen does a wonderful job. And, you know, they have session guys that just play the songs perfect. So, um, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out with the original guys. I mean, Fog Hat just has the drummer, you know. But the songs, the songs outlive the bands anyway. I mean, we're going to die, and our songs are still going to be, you know, go on. No doubt. So, when you see this uh, this tour that's coming out, um, Motley Crue, Death Leopard, Poison, do you think that's good for Great White? Love it. <laughs> Love it. You know, we play with Vince every once in a while, and uh, the fact that they're going to go out and play huge gigs, I, I think it's the greatest thing on earth, man. I yeah. think it's just wonderful. I want to see more tours like that. Yeah, I think it brings the awareness of the of the 80s rock uh, era back, you know, to everybody, to the forefront of everything. And that's a good thing. I think it'll help all the bands from the 80s, you know what I mean? Because and right now, I mean, that thing's absolutely it's, it's selling out. Yeah, I mean, look at how many times rock and roll has died. I mean, it's just, it's obscene. I, I mean, you know, even I remember in the 70s they said rock was dead at one point. And then it comes back. You know, you know what I noticed is like, I've been to Europe, and I remember one time I went outside of a hotel, it was like 30 kids dressed like me, like I dressed in 1986, <laughs> you know. And they're like, 20, they're like 20 years old, you know. And they discover our stuff and they love it. It, it. If time rolls by, like the 90s kind of rolled by with the whole Seattle boom, to where when you hear our stuff again, it's like sounds fresh again. You know, you're like, whoa, I forgot all about these tunes, man. This, this stuff's badass. And uh, so it comes and goes, you know. And I think a big tour like this is going to, you know, it just brings energy to our era. I agree. Anything you want to say uh, to the fans out there before we wrap up? Yeah, um, just, you know, thanks for the, God, all the years, your stories. I love to hear them. You know, our, our music, I mean, I, I've said it before, but I mean, I'm the biggest, geekiest fan, music fan in the world. I mean, I have all my heroes. I've met most of them. I, songs make me, bring me to a place you know, certain songs or what I was doing at that time. And for our music to be part of our fans' lives is like nothing less than the, a blessing. And so thanks for, you know, growing up with us and being, you know, involved with our music and your loyalty. I mean, we, we play today and they're all out there singing the songs. It, it's just the greatest thing in the world, man. So thank you. Mark, thanks so much for talking with me tonight, man. It was a pleasure. Okay, thanks for having me. That was a great conversation with Mark. He's a very cool dude. I want to give a special shout-out to Blabbermouth, Brave Words, and Sleaze Rocks. They all pick up my story, so make sure you frequent their sites. And check them all out because they're all just a little bit different. Next episode, 
is with Joe Lynn Turner. Now he stated that he told me some things that he's never revealed in any interview before, so you have to check it out. So your best bet is to take your finger and touch the red subscribe on the video and become a subscriber. Thanks for listening. Rock on!